All right. My name is David Sankel um, from Bloomberg, and this talk is about building software capital, um, how to build really high quality code, and answering the question of why you'd want to build really high quality code. So I was at this meeting, and there were like a dozen or so people, there were a bunch of people at this meeting, and this was for a very important project. This was something that was extremely critical, was very important, um, everybody had an interest in this thing. And it turned out that only three of these people were actually software developers. The rest of the people in the room were all support team, uh, marketing, testing, all this other kind of stuff. Only three people were actually doing the work for this project. And as I was sitting in this meeting, I was starting to think, wouldn't it be better if everybody in here was a coder? You know, we wouldn't have all this wasted people that we're just paying to do not the real work, we'd actually get to time, time to market faster, right? You know, think about it. If it takes one man 12 months to do a project, then if you put 12 people on it, then it'll take one month to do it, right? This is, this is a fantastic idea. You know, I'm just thinking about how everybody would be so proud that I came up with this genius idea and uh, you know, people are clapping, and then I started seeing these people clapping that didn't have feet. Um, and then I realized that I had fallen asleep. I must have been dreaming, <laughs> because this is not how the world works. This whole idea where you can just you know add more men to a project and have it uh, get to market earlier it doesn't exist in the real world, right? We all know this, and. This actually has been known for a really long time. How many of you guys have read this book, The Mythical Man Month? Almost everybody, right? So this book was written when I was negative six years old, and, and he basically outlined why this doesn't work. Okay, this is uh, Brooks who wrote the book, and the idea is if you have a whole bunch of software developers and they're all working on the same project, there's a lot of communication that needs to happen in between these guys. Everybody needs to talk with everybody in order to make sure they're all in sync with the project. And what ends up happening is this intercommunication, the cost of maintaining that becomes so high that you end up losing productivity. So realistically, your graph looks something like this. If it takes one man 12 months, you throw another man on it, you improve your productivity, uh, you, you know, maybe even a couple more productivity improves, uh, but then it starts taking longer to release the product when you have more men added to it. And then you get to this red area. And what this red area is up on the top right, that's blood, right? That's when the project doesn't actually deliver and somebody's going to be shedding blood because of this thing. So ideally, you wanna have a team about the right size. So it's often commented that you know, the right team size is about two pizzas worth of team. If you can feed your team with two pizzas, then that's about the right size. And uh, when I've discussed this with somebody before, they, they said, well, you know, I could eat two pizzas by myself. <laughs> so that's obviously a very highly productive software developer. Um, but generally, you have your team sizes optimized about two pizzas worth. So the goal here is to improve your time to market. Uh, you can optimize your team size, uh, and you can go so far doing that. You can hire top developers, because we know that really good developers tend to have a higher productivity uh, than your average developer. So you can go that route. It's gonna be hard to find them. There's not that many, and you're competing with uh, crazy startups that are willing to pay millions of dollars. So is there anything else that we can do? That's the question. How can we improve our time to market without optimizing team size and hiring top developers? So, one thing we could do is we could reuse. So if we have a piece of software and it's already made and we can use it in our next project, then maybe we can reduce the time to market for our next project. So the basic idea goes like this. You start out with one piece of software. Then you make another piece of software which uh, is based on the first one and then you throw some new piece on it and everything just fits perfectly together. Then you do another piece which happens to be unrelated, you put these things together and add a new piece, and so on and so forth. So 
doing this next project, which requires many more lines of code, just requires putting a new piece on top. Um, however, this doesn't actually work like this normally as well. Here's how it frequently works. You start with one piece of software, and then you throw another piece on, and, and, uh, but this second piece that you throw on there, it doesn't fit exactly on the first piece. It's kind of teetering a little bit, it might fall off. The third piece of software that you write has a little bit of mud on the left because it had to get done in a hurry. It's not really that clean. But, you know, the developer says, hey, it works. We got to market on time. Everything's fine, right? Management's happy. Okay, it has a little bit of mud. Who cares? The next piece of software requires more mud and a bunch of sticks to throw this thing together. And you add your new piece on it, which requires more mud and sticks. And the developers start saying, you know, we should really fix this stuff someday. I'm sure you've heard this before. So the developer goes to the man and says, can we rewrite this? And what does the man, the man say? No, I'm not gonna rewrite this. We've got things to do. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna take our previous piece, we're gonna throw a new piece on, and this one doesn't even fit in the same dimension as the other pieces, but, but somehow we were able to make it work. And then the developer says to the man, look, we really need to rewrite this. And let's say this time, he really gives a convincing argument. We need to rewrite this. And the man says, okay, fine, we'll rewrite it. What happens next? Blood. <laughs> Everything blows up. Because getting this whole uh, rewrite done is making the next product come out too slow. The whole company crumbles. Um, Many of us, I'm sure, have seen this happen before. It happens way too often. So the idea in what happens in most companies is you have, as time chugs along and you're increasing the amount of software you have, your technical debt increases. And notice that it's not increasing linearly. This is increasing exponentially. The reason being is that when you have more and more technical debt, you need to take out even more technical debt to pay the, the taxes that you're paying or the interest you're paying for the previous technical debt. And then you get to the point where you just can't even add anything without taking years and years to your product. And that's a really big problem. So uh, your time increases to add new features, um, but eventually, the, basically the idea that I'm trying to get across here is that the greedy algorithm does not win in the long run. You know, just getting whatever, doing, throwing whatever kind of piece of software you need to do to get the features out to, to meet your business needs is not going to solve your long-term goals. Uh, you're gonna end up in this, uh, this problem. And I can tell you from what I've seen for, for larger corporations, uh, larger companies, or even companies that have been around for five plus years, they're in this kind of situation. The technical debt is huge. So we know that the time to market with a debt approach tends to increase over time. But if you take a no debt approach, it stays pretty much linearly. Now there's a little area there to where if you're re you know, trying to release something in two months and you don't care about long-term uh, issues, then it maybe it makes sense to take out a bunch of debt. You know, maybe if you uh, are trying to get some kind of demo done or something along those lines, or maybe a game where you're releasing, you forget about it, but even the gamers are, uh, are think taking this into account these days. Uh, maybe it makes sense, but for the majority of us, the software we work on is the same kind of software someone else is gonna be working on 10 years down the line. So um, the no debt approach is the way to go for the long-term sustainability. So then there's this idea of software capital. Software capital is kind of like the opposite of technical debt. But let's, before we go into what exactly software capital is, let's look at some of the differences. So technical debt, very easy to create. You just, and any, any uh, person who just learns how to program their first day can figure out how to make technical debt. Software capital, on the other hand, is expensive and hard to create. Uh, technical debt, you have this reuse by the gun. And what does that mean? That means that management tells you, you have to reuse this software, otherwise I will shoot you. 
right? That's reuse by the gun. Whereas if you look at software capital, it's voluntarily reused. So someone will just go ahead and say, hey, um, I want to use this. This is going to make my job easier. Technical debt has a very narrow focus. It's usually concentrating only on the needs of a particular problem, whereas software capital, you have a wider focus, uh, more generic in that sense. Technical debt, of course, is ugly. Software capital can be very beautiful. Uh, and then, of course, technical debt is usually incomplete. It'll have things like slash slash to do in it, where software capital it doesn't have any to dos. It's complete. Um, and ultimately, technical debt is going to increase your time to market over time, whereas software capital is going to decrease your time to market. So what is software capital? And the best example that I can think of is stood vector. How many of you guys use stood vector? Everybody uses stood vector. How many of you guys have had to debug stood vector? I see three, four. These are probably like the standard library implementers holding up their hands. Generally, you just trust stood vector, right? That thing doesn't have any bugs. You never really think about it having bugs. It just, it works, right? Documentation for stood vector, it's abundant, right? We have it documented in maybe 30 books, a million sites on the internet. It's all over the place. Stud vector is a great example of software capital. It's something we can use to get our job done easier and quicker. So these are some attributes of software capital. It's useful, it's clean, it's complete, reliable, general, documented, bug-free, efficient, and reusable. This is the kind of software we want to develop to decrease our time to market. So this phrase, software capital, this was coined by uh, Dean Zaras in 1996 in this article that he wrote called Software Capital Achievement and Leverage. So use this link to go get it or just search for it on the internet. It's an interesting read. Um, unfortunately, it just, it was written back then, but it got published like a couple weeks ago. So it's kind of neat. But he defines software capital as the cumulative technology that can be redeployed to new situations. This is the opposite of technical debt. Technical debt, if you think about it in financial terms, it uh, requires you to pay interest over time. Whereas software capital, it gives you dividends over time. It pays you instead of you paying it. So it's really the way to go. Um, so as John Lakos would put it, uh, this is kind of a, uh, a graph of the components in your organization through dependency. The things at the top depend on the things underneath. Um, where is it most important to have your software capital? That would be the stuff at the bottom, the stuff that's most likely going to be reused. Uh, it's most beneficial to have really high quality software being written at that layer. OK. Um, but how do we build software capital? But before we get into that, which is really going to cover the rest of the talk, if you're sold on the need for developing software capital, that's really all you need. The rest of these things are just tips on how to do it. But you will figure out how to write software capital if, you, if it's important enough to you. You'll just see, OK, this thing turned out to be pretty crappy. Um, what processes, what things can we do to make this better and make this not happen again? But it's, it's the approach, it's the attitude that you take when you go into a software project. So there are going to be seven principles here. Uh, that I'm going to go over and just give you some tips on how to write really high quality code. The first principle is code reviews. Okay, so the idea is you want to get an outside opinion about how your code looks. Now, we all know that you think that your kid is adorable, right? You think that your kid is the most beautiful kid in the entire world. However, before you put your kid into a beauty pageant because you think he's so cute, you might want to get an outside opinion. So I often get asked a question. I'm just going to preempt it. Where did I get this picture? I searched Google for ugly kid. <laughs> Somebody thinks this kid is gorgeous. So we want to get an outside opinion. And the things that we create is from our perspective are great. It's good to get an outside opinion. We want to see others, how they see our code. Um, is that interface really intuitive? 
Well, someone else can tell you. And I can tell you that if you get a code review by one other person, you know, to carefully go through every line and write all their comments, you're gonna get 90% of the feedback you'd get from getting a dozen code reviews. It's very, very useful to get a code review. So getting that outside opinion is very important. Another reason why code reviews are nice is because you find bugs. So almost every code review that I do, I'll find a bug in somebody else's code. I don't claim that I find all the bugs, but I find bugs. So a hidden bug in a piece of code that you don't know about, this is just unaccounted for technical debt. It's waiting to rear its ugly head. And the benefit of finding the bug early is the closer you are to actually introducing the bug, the cheaper it is to fix generally. If you're trying to debug something which was written 10 years earlier and has 100 layers between you and them, that can be really expensive. And you're gonna spend a lot of your life in a debugger if you have a bunch of technical debt. So finding bugs early on is really key. Another benefit of code reviews is standards and socialization. The idea is you wanna do the best thing everywhere. If one guy happens to figure out a really good way to do something, and he's the only one who does it, that doesn't really benefit you as much as it could. Whereas if he does a code review of you, of your code, and then he teaches you, oh, well, you could do this in a better way, and then you teach that to other people, you basically get this communication uh, going through the team really quickly. So you get this knowledge transfer, which is wonderful. Um, so the idea is, and also you have a couple people looking at the same piece of code, um, you basically don't eliminate that thing where like, oh yeah, that piece of code, that one guy handles that. You don't wanna have that in your organization. So the, uh, another issue with code reviews is you get accountability, right? Does this thing have documentation? Is this thing unit tested enough? Does it follow our coding standards? Now two people are responsible for this code. I don't know about you guys, but when I write code, I love solving the problem. And when I finish solving the problem, I feel great. It's like, yeah, I did it. And then adding documentation and stuff like that, that's kind of a chore. Um, maybe some people love writing documentation, I don't know. I don't. But having somebody to keep me accountable and say, hey, you know, you really ought to add documentation for that, or you really need to add unit tests for that, even though I feel like it's complete, that really helps a lot. Um, and it's a lot easier to be objective when you're reviewing somebody else's code. When I'm reviewing it, oh, we don't really need to document that. But if I'm reviewing somebody else's code, it doesn't hurt me to say it needs more documentation, they're gonna write it. So, just a few tips on code reviews. Um, if you haven't done these before, I like the idea where you can choose anybody on the team to do a code review for your code. Having one code review czar, that doesn't work out very well. Um, and you're only getting input from one person. Uh, one round of feedback is usually enough uh, to do a vast improvement of the code. If it's something really critical, you might want more. Um, and this works extremely, extremely well with people who love to learn. People who don't love to learn, this, this approach doesn't work very well. I wouldn't want them on my team. Um, tooling can help. You know, there's great stuff like GitHub Enterprise and all that out there, or specific code review tools. Um, but don't let that stop you from doing this. You can do it with emails. I've done it with emails for years. You just write in the email, you put the line number, and you put the comment, and send it to the person. And one nice tip is using did you consider language. You know, think about how you feel if somebody looks at your code and says, this is garbage. You really need to improve that. You know, it hurts. And people are people. There's just a really simple trick you could do. Instead of saying, this is crap, you should have done it this way, you just say, did you consider it doing it this way? And it just seems to go over a lot better that way. So try that. So the second principle in running really high quality code is having standards. Um, why do you have standards? If you have a bunch of variants, even in spacing in your code, that takes people to time to think and like recalibrate and like, okay, I'm looking at this other file which was indented this other way. You can improve your productivity by having everything the same. Really, what the standard is oftentimes doesn't matter as much as having a standard which is globally used. Um, it improves the professionalism of your code, and if your code looks professional, it's more likely to, get, uh, to, be, re to used, uh, be used by other people. Um, and you know, it makes tooling possible. If you have everything done the same way everywhere, then you can write a little script to update your code when you need to in the future. So what goes into a standard? I would say formatting, any kind of idioms that are uh, things that are common to your organization or the type of code you're writing, um, documentation requirements, how to organize things, and whatever is the best practice that you can think of. So I would say that tooling is a must for your standards. If you aren't using Clang format, I 
start using Clang Format. I pity the fool who doesn't use Clang Format these days. Stop wasting your time manually formatting your code. It gets complete consistency. It's fully automated. Uh, it's just everybody should be using that these days or something like it. Um, when you get new standards change or something new has been recommended, retrofitting the old code is pretty important and I recommend you do that whenever it's feasible. Um, the code base is a thing that can be operated on. You know, don't think just about the little area that you're working on. Somebody needs to have the big picture in mind and to operate on that and you need tooling to do that. Um, you've seen several talks about Clang using Clang as a library to refactor your code. That's a really good idea. Um, Clang Tidy, you can add plugins to this thing and then for your particular coding standards, you can have it go in and even fix certain violations, which is nice. Um, so tooling is a really good idea when you're working with standards. So what is the criteria? How do you know if something goes into the standard or not? Uh, or what, what decision you should make when you have two competing options? So the rule I like to go by is objective criteria always trumps subjective. I think this looks cooler versus there is an objective reason as to why this one works better. So if you have a subjective argument versus an objective argument, objective argument just wins. They're on different dimensions. And a concentration on reuse is really important. You know, If we implement it this way, is this going to hurt or improve um, our ability to be reused? And when people reuse code, a lot of times it's not just based on objective factors, it's based on subjective factors. So if it looks more familiar, that might be a good reason to have a, have a standard go that way. And don't waste time on trivialities. Just cut off those discussions because they can end forever. Um, or they can, they don't end forever, they never end. Okay, the third principle here is unit testing. Why would you unit test? Uh, unit testing, you can kill bugs before they cause problems. Uh, sometimes you find bugs when you do your unit testing. Uh, you're fu future proofing against new bugs. Um, just having unit tests gives the impression of reliability. And people will just say, oh, well this is really unit tested, so I'm more likely going to use it because uh, I get the impression that it's more reliable. And safe refactoring is another one. If you need to take some code and refactor it and it's well unit tested, you have a lot of confidence that your refactor didn't break anything. Um, but you get a lot of excuses with unit testing. You know, oh, this is GUI code. That, that seems to be just a common excuse. Oh, it's GUI code, therefore I cannot unit test it. Um, with a modularized GUI, you actually can test the pieces. So you break it out and you don't, don't let that be an excuse to not unit test your code. Um, or, oh, this depends on disk or network or, or this other kind of thing. You, know, you can use dependency injection to solve that and we'll look at that in a minute here. Um, or I already know the code is correct, okay? Some people prove their code. And I think it's a wonderful thing to do. I do it myself. Um, but that doesn't replace unit tests because I prove my code but the next person who goes in and modifies it probably isn't going to. So we need to get flagged when somebody breaks the code. And uh, of course, the most common excuse is I need to ship this thing. Uh, well, if you have a code review barrier and you say this code needs unit tests before it's gonna pass review, people will do it. Otherwise, they aren't gonna get their stuff in, uh, in the master branch. So, um, designing for testability is really important and I'm just gonna show one thing which will handle 90% of the cases here uh, when people say they don't know how to unit test their code. So here's a good example. We have some kind of server code so that people will just say, oh, we're talking to a server, we poss can't possibly unit test this code. Um, we connect to a server, we send a request asynchronously and we have this lambda here which handles the request. So how will we unit test this code? Well, one thing we can do is in that else branch when we're uh, handling our non-error uh, payload, we're gonna parse that result somehow. You can refactor that function into a separate component or a separate function, and now that function can be very easily unit tested. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is you can take your server and make an abstract server. So this thing which has a connect and a send request operation on it, and inherit from it and say, okay, this is going to be a test server. So now I have these functions there, the three at the bottom where I wanna say throw exception on connect, set request response error. I'm controlling how that set request function is going to call that lambda function underneath. Now I can actually write the test code for that. I just use my test server. Um, I say the behavior I want it to have. I throw it into my function and I can verify the kinds of results that I have. So 
this works. It's a really simple technique and it's widely applicable to all these situations where you don't think that you can unit test your code. It's called dependency injection. I've heard it called a few other things, but I think that's the most common way of calling, or the way of naming that thing. And then tooling is really important for unit testing. Continuous integration server. You know, have a server which builds your code and runs your unit test uh, on a commit. That seems to be pretty widespread these days, but if you're not doing that, you know, just get, get it started, make it, make it happen. Another thing that's nice is having a try server. And what that is, is I have my code, I commit it, I push it, um, but I'm not going on the master branch, I'm going on my own particular branch. And I go to some website and say, okay, go ahead and try this branch on all the different platforms and give me feedback on that. That can be really, really handy. And the fourth principle is contracts. So contracts are like documentation on steroids. I've heard it called that before. Um, but really they're a different thing. And, and we're gonna go into what, what they mean and why this is important for writing uh, code that's highly reusable. So what are contracts? How would you describe a car? You might say a car is something with four wheels um, that has a top on it. Um, you can drive it, get it from A to B with it, and so on and so forth. A motorcycle wouldn't be a car. But you have this idea of what a car is. Now, each car is really unique. I mean, each, especially different types of cars. They're all different, but they all qualify as car. We have this common understanding, um, but you can change the pieces underneath and still something represents a car. That's kind of what a contract is. This is a description of the behavior of a function, um, omitting the details that you don't really need to know. So, it's precise, a precise and complete specification of guaranteed user visible behavior. This will exclude implementation detail. You don't need to know how the car works, you just need to know how to use it, basically. Um, this is the what and not the how. And an example of this, if you have a sort function, you could have the contract say, put the specified int vector in order from lowest to highest. That is one way to have the contract. But you could also say, put the specified int vector in order from lowest to highest, the algorithm runs in big O n log n time using big O n space. Now, when you make a contract more specific, you're essentially gonna get more use cases out of it. The, more, uh, the fewer guarantees that you have in your uh, contract, that's gonna give the implementation more flexibility. So you have this kind of trade-off in terms of uh, implementation flexibility and the number of use cases something has. And that'll change depending on the kind of situation you have. But in essence, this is an agreement between the user and your implementation. And just like a contract in real life, if you break the contract, the whole contract becomes invalid. Uh, that's the undefined behavior. So you have to abide by these preconditions and I will abide by what I say I'm going to do as the implementer of the function. So oftentimes you'll hear well, the code is the documentation. The code is a very precise description of what this thing is going to do. And, and that makes sense. I mean, it is a, a good thing in, if you have a small project and you just wanna use the code as a documentation. I, I can understand that. However, in a large project, think about uh, if you're modifying one of these pieces all the way up at the top, you're gonna have to, in order to figure out what this function does, you're gonna have to look at the implementation of the functions it calls and then the implementations of the functions that it calls all the way down to the bottom, that's just way too much work to have to go through all these different functions to the very bottom. Uh, nobody can do that on a large scale project. So the code as a documentation just cannot work and it's pretty easy to see why. So why would you use contracts? Well, it's, it's an objective way to define what a bug is. A bug is a broken contract. Um, if somebody calls a function not meeting the preconditions, then there is a bug, and the bug is in the caller of the function. If there's a bug because I didn't meet the contract specification for the function I'm implementing, there is a bug, and it's in the implementation of that function. So it's really useful to be able to, uh, to look at contracts this way and to be able to figure out whose fault is this and uh, where the bug lies. Uh, 
It allows for tiers of abstraction, which we just discussed. You know, once you get to a certain level, you don't have to look at the implementation. You just have the contract up here, and you don't have to care about the piddly details that are in the implementation of that function. Um, if you have some code which is highly reused, you can, make, you can modify the implementation of that function and have complete confidence that you didn't introduce any bugs, right, as long as you stay within contract. Uh, it also provides a lot of guidelines in terms of what to unit test. Uh, you know, did, well, when, it, when you write a contract and you see, okay, well this actually requires this, this requires this, and that's supposed to provide this, well that's great guidelines to figure out what to unit test for your function. Um, and finally, which is interesting, what is interesting is it makes bad interfaces really stand out. If the contract you write for your function ends up being a whole lot of information and a lot of subtlety to it, then you realize like, oh crap, this is a bad interface, and go and modify it. Whereas if you don't write the documentation for it, you might not even realize just how terrible your interface is. So for contract specifications, uh, what does something like this look like? Uh, so the contract uh, specification that we use at Bloomberg, uh, all the stuff you see underlined up there is wording that's precise and specified by our contract schema. So use the schema. Uh, and keep, keep everything consistent through code reviews. Uh, otherwise, you, I don't think you can really have contracts without doing code reviews uh, and have someone enforcing that. Uh, make it convenient. Having the contract in the header is really nice. Uh, separating out your inline functions. You, know, you can put your functions inline in your class or you can give the declaration and the implementation later on in the file. I recommend the latter because that way someone has a concise and easy to read uh, contract specification of your class that you're working with. And uh, finally, keep your contracts human read readable. If someone sees legalese or markup, if you go crazy with Doxygen, they're just gonna ignore it, right? And then they don't do any good for anybody. So having a human readable contract specification is very important. Um, and I recommend the Bloomberg uh, contract specification, and this is not because I work there. This is the best contract specification that I've been able to find out there really good quality. It's part of the BDE coding standard. Go get this thing and download it. And what's awesome is that this thing has a Creative Commons license. So you just copy and paste that thing into your coding standard and then modify to your liking, and that's okay. So the fifth principle for writing really high quality code is having really good interfaces. And I'm not talking about user interfaces, I'm talking about the programmatic interface that you provide in your header file. So I worked with this, uh, this one guy, and he was very troublesome to work with. He was a manager, did not understand anything about code. And he said, you know, I, what I really want is just a green button. I press the button and it does the thing. That is the ideal user interface for everything. Um, that doesn't actually work a lot of times. Um, coming up with a good interface, it really is an art form. And, uh, you need to be general in the right ways. If you're gonna add a template parameter to your class that you're writing, or your class template that you're writing, you know, is that the right template parameter? Are people actually going to use that? Does it make sense? Um, a lot of, you know, becoming a really good C++ software developer is knowing when not to use templates. Um, like, there's a lot of boost libraries, in my opinion, that, uh, where people don't really get this that it doesn't provide a user, I mean, if, well, it's really clever and it uses a whole bunch of template parameters, uh, people just can't use it because you're generalizing in the wrong ways. Having really simple contracts, uh, that's gonna get a lot of reuse. Keeping your, uh, your parts into manageable pieces, uh, build on recognizable patterns. If someone recognizes the pattern that you're using, they're gonna be more likely to use it. Um, and naming is really important, so spending time on finding the right name for a function or a uh, class, I think is time well spent. Uh, but again, you know, make sure your art is critiqued by other people besides you. Oh, and yeah, math can be a really good guide to user interfaces, and I'm not gonna go into more depth than that, I've talked about that before, but uh, if you learn how to use math to guide your designs, that tends to help a lot. And along these same lines, organization is really, really important. How you organize your code, uh, if it's a consistent organization, uh, that can help a lot. So 
Uh, most of this is taken from uh, John Lankos' book, which I'll talk about later. But the idea is you have three different levels. You have a component, which is a header and CPP combo file. You have a package, which can either be a library or an executable. And then you have a package group, which is a collection of packages. We're just organizing things in this way. And three levels seems to work well in practice. So one way of doing this is you have your header files. The name of your header file is organized by group, package, and component group forward slash package forward slash component. Um, and then you have the .h and the .cpp file similarly named. And then your namespaces correspond to your group package, your group and package name, and then your component is the name of the class that's in there. Uh, you have a connection between your physical uh, layout, which corresponds to your files and how you organize things in directories. Uh, that corresponds with your logical, uh, uh, with your logical issues, which is your name spacing and your class names and that kind of thing. So if you're wondering how to access a class, you always know the place to include it, right? If you know the, the group and the package, then you know how to, how to access that class. It makes it very easy to keep your class, your includes consistent with what you're using in your implementation files. Um, keep your class member functions to be only those that require private access to your class. That helps a lot, that makes it so you can, uh, if you're gonna modify some kind of function which uses your class, uh, if you're going to modify your private parts, you only consider the things that actually access your private parts. So you can separate like a circle class in this instance, which has the things that require the private data from a circle util class, which happens to use that private, well, ha which only uses the public fun functions to implement its functionality. Um, and then keep all these things consistent. So, you know, class circle, class circle util, where you have your static functions. And this reduces coupling. It's, it's, some of this stuff, it's hard to appreciate until you've actually worked with a code base that works this way. Um, but it's a relief uh, to, to use something like this when it's organized this way. Um, multiple classes in the same component. Uh, why would you do that? So one reason why you would put multiple classes in the same component is if they have circular dependencies, because you don't want to have circular dependencies between your components. Uh, friends should stick together, as John likes to say. Uh, so keep all that stuff in the same component. And as you're naming the classes that are staying in, if all your classes are in the same component, or there are several classes in the same component, they all can't be named after the component. So one way to do that is to call them the component name underscore, and then the class name which belongs in that component. That way you still keep that correspondence, like whenever I see a class name, I know exactly which include to grab it from. So uh, more rules for organization. One class per, uh, per component, generally speaking. Uh, a component consists of a single header and a single CPP file. That just simplifies things. Uh, packages consist of logically related components that have similar dependencies. That's the kind of rule to figure out if something belongs into a package. And no circular dependencies between components, nor with packages, nor with package groups. That makes your system a lot easier to reason about and also improves testing. So if you figure this out and you have all your packages and their dependencies figured out, you can actually look at what the big picture is for your company. You can make a graph and see, okay, what are my package groups? How do they relate to each other? And you get this kind of bird's eye view of your software capital, your assets in your company. And it's a really good view to have. So for more on organization, read John's large-scale C++ software design book. If you don't have this book, if you haven't read it, please go on Amazon and buy it, and especially read this part in organization. It's really important. John is coming out with a new book. Um, unfortunately, he's been almost ready for several years now. But hopefully, it'll be really soon now. And I highly recommend that because I've already started reading some of it. So the sixth principle here is innovation. Everybody loves innovation. Um, great things happen. Uh, the world is changing. We're getting smarter. We're learning more. Uh, with C++11, we got to have smart pointers and R value references and Lambda functions. These were great innovations. C++ 17, we got optional, we got variant. Well, actually, we didn't really get a heck of a lot with C++ 17, but we're hoping for C++ 20, we're gonna get some real innovations. But with innovation, you have a tax. So if we think about this financially, this is just a tax that you get every year. Things are improving, 
and you have a tax and you can decide to pay it or you can decide to incur technical debt because of it. So new stuff is great, but it almost always adds complexity, right? C++ is not getting simpler over time. To be a C++ expert, you gotta know all the no old stuff and all the new stuff, um, and that isn't too fun. Uh, innovation is the cause for code rot, so your code, which looks great in 1990, does not look so great anymore. That's code rot. And if you don't pay your taxes, you're gonna incur technical debt. So, how do you pay the innovation tax? Training, going to conferences, reading new books, and of course code reviews can be a great way to disseminate that kind of information. And uh, make modernizing your code base a priority. Don't let it sit there in the old. Um, and automation can help a lot with this. Uh, some of the Kling tools, for example, can go in and update your code to C++11 uh, style constru constructs. So it's really important to pay the innovation tax, otherwise you're in danger of hitting back that old exponential growth of technical debt type problem. Um, and it is hard to convince people that to pay the innovation tax, but it is well worthwhile in the long run. So the seventh principle here is infrastructure. What's infrastructure? This is the stuff that everything else that your company does with, with regard to its software is based upon. Um, this includes things like version control, uh, continuous integration, your build systems, the core libraries that you use, your coding standards, and anything that's going to have like a sweeping effect on your code base. This is what I call infrastructure. And I would say that too often uh, this is ignored. Uh, but the real thing here is that somebody needs to own this big picture. Someone needs to own infrastructure. And who's the right person to do this? This is not an easy task. Uh, you can do one small mistake in your infrastructure and the whole edifice comes crumbling down. So you need to put your best people, the people with the most experience, the highest technical expertise on your infrastructure. Uh, people make the mistake and they think, oh man, well, we're gonna upgrade to, let's say, QT5 from QT3. Let's put an intern on that. Not a good idea, right? I mean, I, and, and you can understand why they would wanna do that because it's hard to make the connection between the infrastructure uh, expenses that you have to pay to the actual benefits, you know, that you get from a company, you know, whatever kind of financial things, selling your software or whatever. But it does have a really tremendous impact. Um, so you got to do it right. And putting your best people on that, I would highly recommend, and, and do make it a priority. So if you put all this together, you can end up creating something which is beautiful, which is big, and can last decades, hundreds of years. We don't know, we haven't seen software on that level. But if you wanna make something which is really going to last, and it's gonna be appreciated for a long time, you have to put these principles into place. Otherwise, eventually it will fall. So, to sum up, the real value of your organization is its software capital. If you do not have software capital, you're in danger of some startup coming along and just killing you with new features because you're too slow to uh, be able to catch up. And this is the key to your sustainable competitive advantage. If you have a bunch of software capital and you can add new features to your product quickly and even quicker as time goes on because you have all these things already written, um, that's gonna give you a huge advantage going forward. And here are the, the seven things that, uh, that I recommended. Uh, but anyway, this, this concludes my talk, so we can now open it up to questions. How are you doing, David? Good. Uh, it was an interesting talk, but I, the thing that kind of struck me throughout uh, was that most of the contracts I've ever worked, the team who are doing the software know all of the stuff you've just said, but you can't actually achieve it because uh, management's come along and said that we need this thing delivered by this date, and we sit down and we look at what we need to do, and we kind of just tick off a lot of the building of software capital because you just can't get it done in the time that's allocated. And how would you uh, counter that as being really the problem that's at hand, rather than people not knowing what to do, but rather that they don't have the time or the management will to do it? Uh, good question. So the question is, how do you convince your manager to, 
to care about software capital, in a nutshell. Um, and I think that what's really important is to make an argument based on the long-term sustainability of the business. You know, if, if, you, if you just say, hey, we need to you know, do code reviews, hey, we need to do this, we need to do that, they don't connect that, they just see, oh, this is something the developer wants, he doesn't really see my needs as a manager. So I think making the argument in terms of, you know, where do you want this company to be in 10 years? Um, are you scared about a startup coming along and, you know, killing us? Uh, I think that's the way to do it. That or get yourself into management. It's interesting, actually, you mentioned about startup. The single biggest thing I've noticed in the current contract I'm in is that there is a huge worry that a startup is going to come along and kill us because they'll move quicker and deliver a product faster than we will because they've cut more corners than we have. So, <laughs> do you see the problem? Build your software capital. Yeah. Hey, so these are really good suggestions for building software capital, um, but suppose you have a project right now that needs to continue the ship and has a large amount of technical debt. How do you uh, start going into converting that technical debt into software capital while continuing the ship? Um, well, you can't make like, okay, so the question is, you know, how do you just take a, you have large software projects, you need to uh, get things delivered. How do you can you get things delivered and start paying that technical debt or building software capital at the same time? Um, you can't make resources come out of thin air. So it has to be made a priority. Whether you spend one person on it, multiple people on it, or you do it in your spare time, it just needs to be a, uh, a concerted effort that's really believed by, by all the key people in the organization. I, I don't think you can really do it as just a single software developer. I'm going to go after the technical debt. You might get fired because you're not producing enough of other stuff. So um, it's really important to sell this uh, to the people who care. And I, I think it's possible. No more questions? I guess I must have covered everything. It's fantastic. I have one more question. It's just, do you have any good resources or links that you can give to your manager to help convince them that this is the right way to go forward? Uh, good question. Do I have anything that you can use to convince your manager? I would say email your manager and say, watch the first 15 minutes of this talk. <laughs> Maybe that'll help. Yeah, so uh, we already had all the questions that I wanted to ask. I, so what remains, I just want to point out that the contract on square root you had, it's it's really nice contract because it says, give me something, and I, I will give you void. That, that was just a typo on your slides. But, oh, you found yeah, a typo. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out in front of everybody. Um, this is great, but how do we get there from here? In other words, do you have any words of wisdom of how to introduce these things incrementally? Ah, uh, great question from Bjarna. How do we introduce these kinds of things incrementally? Um, and actually, the last uh, place that I worked, we did this. And what we did is we started forming a small core library that other things use, where we had these really high quality standards. And we slowly started to grow it, but we kept the quality of this core library intact as we grew. And this seems to be a good way to do it, because if you just have a huge mess, it can be overwhelming. But figure out what's used by everybody, whether it's a shared pointer implementation or whatever, and start with that one thing and make that really high quality and then build on it. Uh, thanks a lot for wonderful talk. I love hearing more people talk about all those things. Uh, it occurs to me that most of the things that we're talking about here are pretty clearly best practices. And a lot of the argument, I think, for convincing your management can be at some point, like, Best practices, like they're best for a reason. I know you don't see it, guys, but if you go ask 100 developers, they'll all say, yeah, best practices, so maybe we should best practice management. Hey, guys. But yeah, send them to this talk. Send them to previous talks. Like, it's going to take the, you know, culture five or 10 years to win this, but we're getting there. So thanks, Dave. Thanks, Titus. I, I love that. Best practices are best practices for a reason. <laughs> John? David, I think you did a really good job at explaining a lot of the, the concepts, and I'm, I'm very, very proud of you because I, I don't think I could have done nearly as good a job as you did. Um, David's been working at Bloomberg for less than a month, 
and he seems to have totally embraced everything that we aspire to. But the reason I'm here is to tell you uh, that it isn't easy, and it requires a lot of fortitude and a lot of patience in order to change a culture. When I joined Bloomberg in 2001, I can't even begin to tell you what, what I saw there. We were talking about people who didn't have a computer science degree, who were anything but software engineers, and had made a lot of money for the firm, and you can't just tell them that they, they don't know what they're doing. You just can't do that. Even if you believe it, it's not true. They know what they're doing. They're making money for the firm. Of course, five years before I joined, they realized the technical debt that they had was so great uh, that they had to do something. So they, they, they started. It's almost like a Christmas Carol where, where uh, a Scrooge's partner, you know, he had this chain that was so long but they couldn't fix it. They just couldn't. They didn't have the ability to fix it, so they gave up. Five years later, I joined, and they said, basically, can you help us? And I said, I'll give it a shot. Now, how many people told me, you can't win. You cannot win. There's no way. How many people have come here and tried to win? You can't win. But see, I'm stubborn. So that was 15 years ago. Now, it's an entirely different thing. And I want to tell you that if you are slow and steady, if you show people, you can't walk in and tell people what to do. I couldn't do that. But over time, if you demonstrate value and you do something, and, and what David said, which is you start a project on the side and you create something that is pure and you say, if you put anything bad in that, I will kill you. <laughs> And you just stand by that, and when no matter what manager tells you, you just say no. You just say no, just no. No is the answer, no. And there'll be many managers that tell you to do something. You say no. Now, you can't say no a lot of times. You have to choose your no. So nine out of 10 times you say yes. Do you want coffee? Yes. Are you gonna create a cyclic dependency here? No. <laughs> and then over time, this becomes software capital. And then when you say no, you really mean no. Like if you do that, oh my goodness, I'm going postal. So this is <laughs> happening to me even after 15 years. But when I say no, no means no. And it doesn't matter who asked me to do it. You know, that's what you have to do. You have to establish credibility and then no means no. And so that's the way it happens. And building something on the side that you have authority over and you've demonstrated value is how this happens. And it takes years and years and years. But eventually, you can take this pile of goo, you can demote, that's a keyword, demote the functionality to a lower level that's stable and reasonable and, and forward it. And then eventually, this piece of Swiss cheese will crumble and you'll have what you want and you can build new software off of this. But it takes time. Thanks, John. Uh, one quick question. So do you test the code you write for the unit testing? Do I test the code that I write for unit testing? No, because somebody else provided that. <laughs> but <laughs> hopefully it's correct. Uh, okay, so let's pretend I'm the manager and basically I say all those seven principles, they sound nice, they sound smart, but how do I know for sure that they will work for my business? And how do I know I'm not gonna spend resources for writing unit tests and infrastructure and whatever, and it just won't pay out? And I'm gonna miss deadlines and it's not gonna work for my business. So as, uh, as the, the keynote mentioned, fear is the greatest motivator. Uh, I think that just give them some case studies where they didn't do this and where the business fell into flames. Um, and successful organizations, I look, at, uh, look at what happened with Gmail versus uh, Yahoo Mail. You know, Gmail came along, had a new interface, and then Yahoo Mail tried to come up and make something just as good. And what happened? They weren't able to get something just as good in time, and Gmail totally took the market. You don't want that to happen to your organization. That's but do we know that Gmail succeeded and Yahoo failed due to Yahoo not using the seven principles in Gmail? Well, we know that this improves your time to market. So um, I, I, I don't really know what else to tell you. Do you want to talk about tests being untested and, and, and Ethereum philosophy there? 
about the tests being untested? He was asking. Like, oh, do you have about, tests have, for your tests? So I'm going to say I don't know much about that topic. Uh, anyone that's interested, let's all talk later. All right. Hi there, how you doing? Um, I would like to suggest some uh, alternatives. Uh, if you're exasperated and um, you reach a brick wall in trying to build software capital, these are some other things that you can try. I've done all these things. Um, I know that they work. So one is simply to leave your current job. Uh, <laughs> so that makes all the technical debt go away right away. <laughs> Um, so another possibility is to start your own company and, and then you get to dictate the terms of the development. Uh, that's a really great option today, especially with all of the, the social media tools that are available like GitHub and, and things that you can do. The community is digital now. Uh, a third possibility is to join a startup that has a very small number of programmers and um, you know, demonstrate your abilities and, and encourage them to build software capital from the beginning so you kind of head off the debt before it has a chance to get created. Yeah, those are three alternate techniques. Thank you. Great, thanks. Three different ways to give up. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you very much for that talk. That was fantastic. I think uh, a lot of these uh, hinges on good tooling. I think you've mentioned that, and your infrastructure point is basically that. Uh, what's your suggestion for if you're working in a company that is averse to improving slash changing their tools? Uh, I can think of many things, but for example, continuous integration or using a good, um, a good version control system or you know, other, other tools that might help to build software capital, but the company is just averse of change. Yeah, um, so generally, companies that are averse of change uh, don't change very much, and that's uh, difficult to work with. But I think you have to keep coming back to the business arguments as to why, you know, for the long-term success. And some companies will not take this advice, and they will fall to the wayside. Mm -hmm. And that's just all there is to it. All right, thanks. Hey, uh, in the company I work in, we have uh, something called a Boy Scout rule, like every, every developer agrees upon. It's like when you come in and see a piece of code, you are asked to leave it in a better state than you have found it. And I would like to hear your opinion on this kind of stuff. Um, so, so that's an interesting rule. So I guess leave the code in a state to where nobody can make it into a better state. That would be the kind of rule that you know trying to build software capital would uh, be closer to. So um, we, I, I actually encountered this scenario. We we find a bug, or the customer reports it. We fix it add a regression test for it so that it will, it will not reoccur in the future. And then the client asks, okay, but how can we guarantee that it will not reappear? The problem is there is a discrepancy between what the client understands as a bug and what we developers do. So in our case, this particular bug was this particular occurrence with, on this particular data with this particular whatever circumstances. And the regression test is, is for that. Maybe we try to generalize a bit. But what the client sees is that, okay, the software crashed. I don't want to see crashes anymore. How can you guarantee that? It's basically impossible to answer with this unit testing, regression testing methodology because we all know that there is no such guarantee. But what, what would you answer in such a situation to the client to, to convince them that still the outcome after this fix is a, is a better quality software, and you should trust us that this fix is worthwhile and worth to include it in the next release. Um, so if you're running a piece of software and it crashes for your users, they already don't trust you very much. Yeah. Um, so the best thing is to not let that happen. Try to write your really high quality code so that they don't face those crashes. And if you do get those kinds of issues, then take them very seriously and start rethinking, you know, was this code reviewed? Was um, this code unit tested? Like, who's responsible for this? How did this happen? And the answers to those questions are how you can improve your ability to create software capital. All right, this is the end of the session. Thank you guys very much.